This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 17th chapter of Leviticus, verse 11. Leviticus 17, 11. The Lord is giving the law to Moses. He is establishing the way by which man can have atonement for sin. And as he has given to him the various sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, the Lord declares, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. I was in conversation with an Israeli Jew. He said to me, Chuck, my father is a very devout man. He says his prayers every day. He reads the scriptures every day. He loves God. Do you mean to tell me that just because my father does not believe in Jesus that he is lost? I responded to him acknowledging that this was a tremendous problem for me to understand. For I recognize and acknowledge that his father does love the Lord. His father is very devout, and I have no doubt at all concerning his sincerity in his worship of God. And yet he does not believe in Jesus. And I said, that does pose in my own thinking a tremendous problem. But there is also another problem that I see. God provided with his covenant with Israel a way by which their sins could be forgiven. What does your father do about his sin when in God's covenant with Israel he declared without the blood there is no remission? That the blood is for the atonement of the soul. And it is the blood that makes the atonement. What does your father do about his sins? And he went on to explain how that his father felt that his good works should be accepted by God. And he seeks to live a good life and as long as his good works overbalance his bad works, he feels that God should accept him. I said, that is not the covenant that God made. God said that the way to approach him and to come to him was through the blood sacrifices. That is the way atonement is made for sin. And thus, that is the problem that I see with your father and anybody else who would try to come to God or be received by God by their good works, by their sincerity or by their devotion or anything else. We so often hear a person say, but he's such a good person. If anybody deserved to go to heaven, he deserves it because he's so good. And, and somehow, somehow, we think that God should accept a person's works or a person's goodness as a substitute for the provisions that God has required in the sacrifice and the shedding of blood for the covering or remission of sins. Here in our text, God first of all declares the life of the flesh is in the blood. 
I want you to compare that with the first words on the subject of blood in the World Book Encyclopedia. It declares, blood is the life stream of the human body. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood is the life stream of the human body. Actually, they've paraphrased the scriptures. They're saying the same thing. Blood is the life stream of the human body. Now, I know that the Bible is not a scientific textbook, and so many times people will make that statement, and that's true, I accept that. It wasn't intended to be. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. It's not a science textbook. However, inspired of God, whenever the Bible touches upon any scientific subject, it should be in total harmony and accord with the known facts of science. And it is interesting to me that in this particular case where the Bible crosses in a scientific subject and talks about the blood, that it is perfectly accurate when it declares the life of the flesh is in the blood. World Book goes on to say, no part of the body can live without this red fluid. Blood carries oxygen and food to every part of the body. It carries waste products away from the various body organs. It also fights disease germs that enter the body. The blood is the life stream of the body. It carries oxygen and food to the cells of the body. And without this oxygen, the cells will begin to die in just a matter of seconds. But it also picks up the carbon dioxide and the other waste materials out of the body. When your cells burn the oxygen, the byproduct of the burnt oxygen is carbon dioxide, a poisonous gas which is picked up in the capillaries and carried through the veins into your heart where it is pumped into your lungs and is then exhaled as you breathe out and it there gets a new supply of oxygen through osmosis and it goes into the arteries and on out into the capillaries where through osmosis it goes on into the cells and feeds the cells the oxygen they need to survive. The blood also picks up food and carries it through the various cells, the fats, the sugars, proteins, and it carries it to the cells of the body. And it also picks up the waste food and deposits it in the liver and in the uh, kidneys, and your body gets rid of its waste. Marvelous system that God has developed. The scientists marvel at the capacity of the blood to coagulate. One of the real marvels of science, how that the platelets in your blood, whenever you're cut, these platelets begin to assemble. They, they send out a message, you know, we've got a, a leak over here, you know, and, and you're bleeding, and all these platelets come rushing to that area where you're bleeding, and they begin to join themselves together and begin to go in and glue themselves to each other until they make a covering over that and a film and they stop the flow of bleeding. And, and this is a mystery and a marvel to the scientists, this capacity of the platelets to mend the tear and, and to stop the flow of blood. To me, it's a, it's a proof that man had to be created by design rather than evolved by accident. Because those first creatures that had blood, the worm, what did he do in the 10 billion years it took to develop the platelets? Why, the first worm would have bled to death the moment he scratched himself crawling across the rock. If it weren't for these platelets that developed and stopped the flow of blood. And so it's all a part of what David said, I am 
wonderfully made, and that my soul knows quite well. I was created by God. The, bloody, the, the blood has the plasma, the white and the red cells, and these platelets, the four parts to the blood. The red cells are interesting. They're the ones that do carry the oxygen and the food to the cells and pick up the waste materials and, and get rid of it. These cells are manufactured in your bone marrow. They have a life expectancy of about four months. So that every day you have about two ounces of blood that has run its life expectancy. The energy is gone. It dies and it's deposited and, and gotten rid of out of your system. But these red cells are so small that setting or laying them side by side, it would take 3,200 of them to be one inch long. Very small. And so your bone marrow has to manufacture about 2 million of these every second to keep up your blood supply from the two ounces of blood you lose every day. However, if you give a pint of blood to the Red Cross, there's a message that goes out somewhere in your body to the foreman of the factory, and it says, you better get some more blood in the body that's about a pint low. And so they go into overtime, and they work 24 hours a day, and they begin to create blood cells at five times the normal rate. Until within 10 days you have your full supply of blood back again. Now who in the world had the wisdom to tell the factory workers produce more blood cells? Get the thing really rolling. I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that my soul knows quite well. Now these blood cells have to ultimately get down to the capillaries and the capillaries are extremely small and it is in the capillaries that the osmosis takes place and the oxygen is transferred into the cells. The capillaries are so small that when the blood gets to the capillaries they have to the cells have to go through the capillaries in single file. They can't all rush at a capillary and, and, and jam their way through. They come through single file. But they have to carry the maximum amount of volume with the minimum amount of friction through the smallest amount of area. So what would be the ideal shape for a blood cell? If it were round, then the capillaries would have to open too wide and the blood cell could not get through these tiny capillaries if the blood cells were round. If they were square or rectangular, then there would be too much friction as they went through the capillaries and your body temperature would rise up to 108, 110 degrees. It is actually the friction of the blood going through the capillaries that heats your body, keeps your body at 98.6 temperatures, degree. You know. So as, as they, what would be the ideal shape of the blood cell to carry the maximum amount of blood through this small little opening of the capillary with the least amount of friction. A pro computer was programmed to mathematically determine the ideal shape of a blood cell. Taking into the consideration the, the factors necessary, it's got to carry the maximum amount of volume, it's got to get through these tiny little capillaries with the least amount of friction. What would be the ideal shape? And as the computer began to draw on the graph the ideal shape, considering all the mathematical factors, would you be surprised to know that it drew a picture of exactly what the blood cell looks like? Sort of a, like a dog bone with the two ends higher than the, the bone coming across with the two little ends on it. Just exactly the shape of a blood cell. With this narrow part in the middle, 
you don't have all of the friction loss. And yet, with the little lobs on the end, they're still small enough to get through the capillary, but they don't create a lot of friction, and you carry the volume. Ideal. Perfect shape. Now, was that designed, or did that come to pass through a tremendous series of fortitudious concurrences of accidental circumstances over 10 billion years? You may believe what you want, but I believe that God created the human body and put in it the blood, the life of the body, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that is why God demands such respect for the blood. And there are so many laws that deal with the blood. Man was not to eat blood. Man was not to drink blood. We were to have a very high respect for blood because it is the life stream of the body. God demanded this great respect for blood because God's word declares it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. Now, God's penalty for sin was death. God declared, the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. And as we read the law and have been going through the law, over and over we have read where God declared, and the man who does this shall surely be put to death. And over and over we read that phrase, he will be cut off from the people. He shall surely be put to death. And this was God's sentence against sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. And thus, in that we have all sinned, we've all been condemned to death. And that death that is being referred to is that spiritual death, man's loss of the consciousness of the presence of God in his life. Alienated from God, separated from God, that's what the death was. And man cannot stand to exist without God. And if a man tries to exist without God, he finds that within there is a churning, there is a yearning, and he is constantly trying to fill this void that, in his, that is in his life, that he's aware of, he's conscious of. Life's got to be more, and so I'm trying this, I'm trying that, I'm trying this experience, I'm reaching out for this level or whatever, and hoping that somehow I can be satisfied and fill this clamant cry of my spirit for God. We see the world today, the pleasure mania and everything else that testifies to man trying to get hold of something that's going to satisfy this deep inner need. Or else a man will try to obviate this cry from within by covering the cry. You hear a lot today about altered states of consciousness. And so a person takes drugs to have an altered state of consciousness. Why would I want an altered state of consciousness? Because I can't stand to live with what I know. I can't stand to live with this emptiness. I can't stand to live with this cry for God. And so I need to somehow sublimate it by getting into an altered state of consciousness, taking drugs to where I don't know where I am or who I am, and it's just, you know, well, where's the party, you know, and, and you just are, are totally bombed out, you know. Alcohol will bring to you an altered state of consciousness, and people have even found out that going, ooh, for over an hour period of time can bring you an altered state of consciousness. Screaming, lying on the floor and screaming for an hour will bring you an altered state of consciousness. People are discovering various ways to have an altered state of consciousness. Why do you need it? 
because you can't stand the thought of living without God. The emptiness, the futility of living without God. And so God provided that our sins might be atoned in order that I might be able to be one with God, to have fellowship with God, to have the life of God. And so God provided the covenant with Israel. If a man sins, if a man transgresses against the law of God, he can take a lamb and he can bring it to the priest. And he then places his head, hands upon the head of that lamb and he confesses upon that lamb his sin, his guilt, and in so doing is transferring the sin and guilt over onto the lamb. And as that lamb now has my sin and my guilt upon it, I slit its throat. And the blood is caught in a basin. And as the blood is flowing out of that lamb and I see that basin being filled with blood and I see the body of the lamb going limp as it is dying, its life is flowing out. I realize that that lamb is a substitute for me. I deserve to die because of my sin. It is getting the sentence that is mine. It's taking my place. It's dying for me. And as that lamb dies, it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. You see, one thing we don't realize is the awfulness of sin. We tend to take a very light, casual attitude towards him and say, oh, he sinned, you know, isn't that too bad? You're a sinner, you know. And take a light, casual attitude. We should not. God does not take a light attitude towards sin ever. Also, we have a total misunderstanding of the holiness of God. And that's where man is failing today. Failing to understand the awfulness of sin and the holiness of God. And in reality, a man is asking God to become a part of his sinful life. You're wanting God to be one with your sin. But we are told that God is so holy and so pure as to not look upon sin. And surely if there should be anything that would convince you that God just will not accept a sinful person in his sin... The cross of Jesus Christ should tell you that as he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God forsake him? And when did God forsake him? God forsook him when he took your sins upon himself. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own way and God laid on him the sins, the iniquities of us all. And when God laid upon him your iniquities, then even God forsook his own son. Now, if God forsook his own son because of sin, how much more us? And how much less can you ever expect God to receive you or to be in fellowship with you as long as you have this sin permeating your life? And that is why God made the provision for the atoning of the sin and it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. And these are the terms by which God declared that he could be approached by sinful man. But man is always, it seems, wanting to come to God on his own terms. I'm wanting to present to God my righteousness or my goodness. No, really. I'm wanting to present to God my good intentions because it rarely goes beyond intentions. Oh, I intend to do better. I intend to quit that. I intend to be good. God, you ought to accept my intentions. 
And I want God to receive me on the basis of my good intentions or my good works. But do you know what God says about your good works? God said that the works of your righteousness are as filthy rags in his sight. Isaiah. In fact, literally, your righteousness is as a menstruous cloth in the eyes of God. Literally. From Isaiah. God has provided that through the shed blood there would be the atonement for the soul. And that is why when we look at Jesus Christ we see God's plan of redemption complete. We see now the value of the work of Jesus Christ in our behalf. We see him as he is there upon the cross. And as the soldier pushes the spear into his side. And as he withdraws that spear. There flows forth blood and water. And with the shedding of that blood. There comes the atonement for the soul. For without the shedding of blood. There is no remission for sins. But there Jesus paid the price. There Jesus took your guilt and your sin and he died as your substitute. Even as in the old covenant, the lamb or the animal that the person brought, his death, the shedding of the blood of that animal was the giving of the life. Symbolically, that animal is being killed. It is dying because that's the penalty of sin. But it is taken my sin. It's dying in my place. And now I can have fellowship with God. That's exactly what God has provided through Jesus Christ's death for you. God made him to be sin for you who knew no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God through him. And we've been redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, from that empty hopeless life but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish and that shed blood of Christ his life flowing out was your salvation it was the provision for your forgiveness of your sins for it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul and thus we read, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. You who have been hassled by the enemy because of your sin. Some of you feel I've gone too far. God could never forgive me. You look at your past and you look at the record and you blush and you're embarrassed at the things that you have done. And you think, surely there is no hope for me. Hey, there is. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. And the glorious thing is that you can go out of here today totally freed from the guilt of your past. You can go out from here today a new person person, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You can go out of here today cleansed and pardoned. You can go out of here today hand in hand with God, walking in fellowship with your creator. For God has made the provision through the blood of Jesus Christ, whereby there is the atonement for your soul. We read in Hebrews that it was impossible that the blood of goats and bulls could actually put away a man's sin. All they could do was cover them, but they looked forward to the perfect sacrifice that God would one day offer when his son would come and take your sin and die in your place. And they all pointed ahead to Jesus Christ who one day would die for you. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities he became our substitute there on the cross and as you see the blood flowing from his side that blood washes and cleanses you from all your sin and now as the result you can come to God and God will receive you and God will accept you 
And you can live in fellowship with God. Your life can now be full and rich and blessed. As I was leaving the house this morning, I said to my wife, our lives are so blessed by God. I can't believe the blessings that God has given to us. Oh, he is so good. And you can know that full, rich life of God's blessing as you live in fellowship with him because the past, the sin, has all been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus opened up the way, the way to heaven's gates. When he died on the cross to redeem all the lost, he prepared a road that leads to his abode. It's a road marked by blood, but it leads us home to God. You say, well, Chuck, that's too narrow for me. I think all roads lead to God. I think a man can come any way he wants, just so he's sincere. Try that one on the judge. Rob a bank. And when the judge says, you rob the bank? Yep. But listen, judge, you ought to forgive me because I was sincere. I really needed the money. And man, I was sincere when I went into that bank. I was determined I was going to, you know, take the money out of that bank. I was really sincere, and thus you ought to forgive me because I'm sincere. <laughs> no, sincerity won't do it. He said, it's too narrow, Jesus said. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. You say, oh, I think we ought to be broader, you know, and just accept that you know, everybody you know, loves God. Somewhere there's a spark of good in every man, you know, and God ought to accept everybody. Jesus said, broad is the way, and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Many there are that are going in. Now, I know that there's some whiny voices, little gurus saying, Oh, paths lead to God. Smell the flowers and find God. <laughs> and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So you have to make a choice. Whether you're going to believe the word of Jesus or some guru. As for me, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, and I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me and washed me from the guilt in my past and my sin, and I have fellowship with God today. I live at peace with God through the blood of his cross. And you can too. If you will only submit to God's way and quit trying to do it your own way. Who are you that you should dictate the terms to God by which you will walk with God? Now, Lord, I'll walk with you if, you know, you know if you're lucky enough to have me come along. But I will as long as you'll bow to this and that and the other. And you, no way. I'm in no position to dictate terms to God. I'm the one who has offended. I am the guilty one. I'm the one sentenced to death. What if some murderer here in, 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 in San Quentin death row, waiting for the day of his execution, would write the governor and say, Governor, I'll allow you to pardon me if you'll, you know, let me uh, do the things that I want to do. Live the kind of a life I want to live. And if you do that, judge, I'll, I'll let you pardon me. It won't work. You're guilty. You've been sentenced. You have no bargaining position. Your only hope is the grace and the mercy of God. Coming God's way. You can't dictate terms. But God has dictated the terms. And you can take it. Or leave it. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the provision that you have made. 
that through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, there's atonement for our sins. There is forgiveness for our iniquities. There's a blotting out and a washing of our past. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. And Lord, we receive your covenant. And we receive that washing and cleansing this day that we might live with you in newness of life, the fellowship with God, and the glory of walking with him. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Your way or God's way, what way will it be? If you'd like to take God's way, I'd encourage you to go back to the prayer room and there just ask God to be merciful to you, a sinner. Confess your sins unto him. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for you. And it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. May the Lord be with you and watch over you and fill you with his love. Cause you to walk in the spirit. And experience the richness of God's grace this week in your life for his glory.